awesome to welcome Texas legends and Uganda men's national team head coach, George Galanopoulos. Galanopoulos spent two seasons as the video coordinator for the Dallas Mavericks before becoming the legends coach. Along with G League, NBA, and FIBA international experience, Galanopoulos' resume includes collegiate experience. While at Indiana University, Galanopoulos worked with the Hoosiers men's basketball team, which helped propel him to his first position with the NBA G League Bakersfield Jam. George, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me, Chris. I really appreciate it. I got a chance to get to know you when you did a uh, coaching clinic uh, for Coach Tube and Basketball Immersion uh, on some N- NBA concepts, which was awesome. And uh, just it's going to be a lot of fun to be able to talk to you about some basketball. Yeah, no, I'm honored to be here. And honestly, I, I listen to your podcast. Um, I, I follow you on Twitter the whole bit and can't tell you enough how much I appreciate the amount of information that you share. Uh, I always feel like I'm poaching a lot more than I'm sharing with the world. Um, so I, I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you. And it's, it's really great. Thank you. Wow, we're going to learn a lot from you and, uh, you know, really a young coach, but uh, tremendous experiences already, uh, having been a head coach of a national team, Uganda national team and uh, NBA G League with the Texas Legends. And uh, maybe let's just start with uh, before we get into some defensive concepts. What is it like to balance those two things? It's interesting. So I've never been in Africa for more than three weeks at a time. So whenever my schedule allows um, it's usually in the off season in June or July of uh, this last Afro basket that we played and participated in was in August. Um, thankfully, the organization I worked for, the Dallas Mavericks, Texas Legends, they're super supportive um, of me doing that. So I've been able to miss some things in the off season um, in order to, um, you know, obviously coach that team and, and they're very supportive of it, which I appreciate a lot. Um, it's interesting. It's, it's, it's hard. Um, it's hard to, be able to uh, manage it from afar um, during the season, obviously, um, you know, duty calls here with the legends throughout the year, Uh, but I do the best I can. We've got a great support system over there. The basketball federation is, is tops in Africa, in my opinion, as far as their commitment to it and the amount of help that we have um, and people in place there from the management all the way down through the local players. Um, So it's, it's tough. It's a challenge, but again, you, you can't do this, whether it's coaching a national team or coaching a G league team, coaching high school, whatever level you, you know, you want, um, you can't do it without good people around you that are hardworking and all pulling in the same direction. So I, I personally have great support and the team has great support from the top down. So that makes it a lot easier for sure. I'm going to ask you about a few differences, but to start with maybe something that is very similar and that is the roster inconsistencies, let's say it uh, from the G league and the national programs and uh, just the challenges of putting together a consistent roster, which, which exists at all levels of basketball, but especially I think at the G league and with these FIBA windows and the national teams. Yeah. I I think first and foremost, the word that comes to mind, um, which I think encompasses all walks of life with coaching specifically is, uh, is adaptability. You know, you have to be adaptable. You have to, you know, hopefully expect the best, prepare for the worst. Um, and especially with COVID, you know, traveling overseas, uh, we, since I've been the national team at coach, we've never had our full team together to prepare for more than two practices leading up to games. Guys start to trickle in, whether it's, you know, the, the local Uganda players that come there together or guys that are coming from overseas that are playing in leagues during the season. Um, it's, it's difficult. Um, You know, in in the G League, we've had weeks where we've had seven players for a practice, you know, so you just got to pivot and adapt um, when you expected having 10 players and guy might be hurt. A couple guys get called up. You got to pivot and play three on three breakdown games instead of five on five, um, you know, whatever the case may be. So you got to be adaptable. I think, uh, you know, for for the G League specifically, you have more time, you know, you have more time with the players. You have more time to install concepts and kind of see it grow and see the players apply those concepts over time. With the national team, it's different. Um, You obviously, you have to prepare um, to be as efficient as possible, even more so than with the G League team with the time that you have. Um, And also it comes with having great people on the roster. So, you know, I think when you talk about building a culture for both teams that you can see the results that you want on the court, uh, you have to have good people around. And I think that's that's what a, a culture starts with. I know it's a big buzzword a lot of coaches throw around, but to me, culture starts with people, the people that you have in the building. Um, you know, you want to get high character people all pulling in the same direction that have defined roles and understand exactly what is expected of them, whether it's staff, players, management. 
Um, they got to know their role in order to, to help push this thing forward. And, and that's what we have with both teams. I'm extremely lucky um, to coach two teams of, you know, that are comprised of good people that are very hardworking, you know, especially the players. So as guys start to trickle in, for example, with the national team one by one or, you know, two guys at a time, um, whatever the case may be, once you get to that final product, which is what you guys see on the court, it's important that you have good people that are going to work hard. They are going to know their role, which is our job as a staff is to define it for them. They're going to accept it. And you can expedite that process of winning and development in a short amount of time if you have those good people in place that are going to embrace the experience, embrace their role. And then the score just kind of takes care of itself, I think, at the end of the day. Well, and that adaptability and everything you just mentioned, I'm sure is one of the reasons the Mavericks support you doing it, because ultimately you come back a better coach with all these experiences that you've had, don't you? Yeah, absolutely. And I think besides the obvious, which you get in-game coaching experience, you get the, the practice and the preparation um, you know, for games, you get better as a coach uh, schematically and tactically from an X's and O's standpoint where I've seen the biggest growth in myself personally so that I could best help the players when I come back to the States is the life perspective um, that it's given me, especially during this, this COVID age, um, you know, the last 18 months, if it's taught us anything that any, everything, you know, and love and care about, whether it's basketball or the people in your life, they can be taken away from you like that. And to go to, you know, a third world country, to go to a continent, to see, the differences between America and those places, you realize how lucky we are here. And, you know, you try to, you try to share that perspective with our players here on a day-to-day -day basis. And I think that's a huge part of coaching too. You know, when you talk about development, I think the first thing we think of is like on-court workouts, right? Player development. Um, I think player development is all encompassing. I think that um, how early they show up to the gym, do you have them on a specific schedule? Do they have a routine? Are they taking care of their bodies? Are you preparing them as a staff for those upcoming games? Um, and then I think the score at the end of the day kind of takes care of itself. Um, but that's that's what it's offered me. We just talked today in, in kind of our little circle with the legends afterwards, um, after practice, just about how grateful we are to be playing this game, you know, in, in a great gym that we have um, with people that we we like and enjoy being around. Um, and we're winning basketball games, you know, and guys are developing, guys are getting better. And it's just something for which you should be really grateful because at any moment it could be taken away from you. Uh, you know, guys can go overseas next year and make 10 times as much money and maybe not enjoy the experience as much. Um, so I think that that sort of life perspective that it's offered me overseas has, has helped in how I've personally coached our players as well as coached our staff too. Yeah, it's tremendous. Uh, the, this whole experience we've gone through for the last two years has definitely been a humbling experience for us all. And uh, great to hear your perspective on that. And uh, you talked about some of the commonalities of the two, but one of the big differences is the pressures on winning versus development. And really, if, and winning matters for both. Let's not Let's not say it doesn't. But in the G League, ultimately, you're going to be focused on player development and getting players ready for playing for the Mavericks. Uganda, you want to win because it's winning that obviously feeds the whole system and that type of success. Can you talk about those very different things when you're talking about culture and building your roster? Yeah, absolutely. So I think when it comes to the national team, and I talk to our team about this a lot, and we, we, we talk about it openly with each other, is I think the pressure in general and the pressures of winning um, and the stresses of winning, especially at, at that level that you're playing, um, I think a lot of that is self-inflicted. I think stress and pressures of winning, you know, can be internalized in, in the incorrect way. Um, I think it could be a misinterpretation of your circumstances. We try to focus on just being grateful for the opportunity. Um, and I think if you can go into games being as calm, collected, and poised as possible because you're embracing the opportunity and not worried about winning, um, we've seen some success with that. Our guys go out, I think, with a clear head, a clear mind, and are able to play at their best. Um, and obviously, when you build out that roster, you need those high character, like minded guys that are going to internalize that experience the correct way. You know, it's not just like, oh, you know, coaches, coaches being hokey again and just talking about embracing the experience. 
it's, it's, it's easy to say, it's harder to do, but if you can get the right people in the building, when you build out your roster from a character standpoint, it expedites the process of winning and development. From the G League standpoint, it is you know, more about development, but I think a huge part of development is winning. Um, and I think if you develop your players properly, you will win basketball games. Um, you just have more time, I think, with the G League to apply concepts, to teach different concepts, you know, to practice the whole bit. There's just more time. Um, but what we're trying to do every single day is not just, you know, not worry about winning. And we're just going out and working out every day and working on individual skills. Part of development is preparing guys to play their next opponent and win that game. And when we don't talk about winning, it's not something that you know, we say, hey, let's go out and win this game tonight. We said from day one, we're not going to talk about winning. We know every time we step between the lines and we're keeping score, whether it's practice, a drill, a scrimmage, or it's a game, we are trying to win the game. I think what happens is you have some players on your team, no matter who you are in the G League, they might be younger and not ready to quote unquote win at this time. You got to let them play through mistakes and whatnot. But at the end of the day, you are preparing guys to play at the next level to win basketball games. So we're not trying to get guys, quote unquote, called up. We want guys to create longevity in their careers. We don't want just the 10 day call up, the one hit wonder, and then you know they're playing somewhere else after 10 days. We're trying to prepare guys and develop them from a professional standpoint and from a skill set standpoint on the court and as teammates um, in order to create longevity with their career so that when they get to that next spot, Whenever that is, could be two years in the G League, then they get a call up, could be a call up after six months if they're ready for it. We want them to get called up and we want them to stay and become the best version of themselves so that they can have long, stable careers. I think that's the goal with, with the G League more than anything. I love that perspective. Uh, it just uh, puts puts it uh, in an easy place for a player to understand that the role beyond obviously getting to the NBA is longevity and success and career. And that doesn't always happen in the NBA for a lot of these players. And I think that's the balance that you experience with this Uganda experience is that you experience a lot of players playing in a lot of different professional situations. And uh, it just shows you how, uh, how big basketball is around the world, isn't it? Yeah, it's, it's unbelievable. And, you know, that that rings true and it started to ring true specifically after this last Afro basket experience we had. Um, I think we placed sixth um, out of 16 teams and, you know, we made it to the quarterfinals the whole bit. We had beat Nigeria's first time in a while, even though they didn't have their NBA guys, um, you know, it was still a big win, I think, for the country. The outreach that we got and felt from um, the people in Uganda, you know, DMs that we got players, staff on Instagram, Facebook messages, friend requests from just the people of Uganda and the messages saying, you know, I think the, the common denominator and the most commonly used word was inspiring. You know, they said, you, you've inspired us and given us hope. Um, I got a message from a mother saying her son was watching all of our games and now wants to play basketball. You know, those are, those are the things that create purpose I think in your life and specifically with this job, you know, we're so focused on winning a lot that I think what that did and what that has offered me is that perspective to help share with our players and our players are feeling it too, where you can go out and win games, but what we have here is a deeper purpose and a deeper meaning into what those wins mean. Um, you know, so we don't, like I said, we don't talk about winning. We're always trying to prepare to win. But as much as we can talk about and reflect and internalize the, um, the impact that we are having um, on a global scale, um, you know, let alone the country, I think is, is pretty neat. And it goes for G League players, too. You never know if there's a five-year-old kid sitting in the stands um, who ends up wanting to play basketball because of the way that you played that day. You know, you've heard some basketball players talk about that a lot. I think it was maybe Kobe Bryant. Um, that said he would play through injury because he never knew if that was somebody's only time that they were going to watch him play. Um, I think it's important to, to approach every single day and wake up with, with a deeper purpose and meaning than just, I'm going to get better today. You know, so. I, it's awesome. And I love that create purpose uh, mentality. And uh, I read an article where you talked about this and you just mentioned it as well, where you try, you don't talk about winning and uh, you know, winning is a byproduct of all these other things that you do. Now, I'm just curious because some coaches obviously say that. Now, give us a perspective on what that actually means post-game, 
after a loss. So we're not going to talk about winning. So let's get right to it. What are we talking about? How are we evaluating the game? And what perspectives are we bringing to players? Yeah, specifically after a loss. Um, I'm not one that likes to talk after losses. I think everybody's super emotional. Um, I, I can be emotional too, but I, I do my best to kind of be that, that calming presence for the group. Um, after a game, like I said, I don't like to talk about it there. I think after our last loss or maybe the loss before that, I literally walked in the locker room and just said, bring it in, you know, legends on three, one, two, three. And, and, and we left. Um, it's, it's just hard to internalize things after a loss like that, depending on what the loss is. Um, you go back, you know, you sit with that feeling for a little bit. It is what it is. You wake up the next day. Uh, I never watch film unless I absolutely have to that night after the game. I always fall asleep. And then if I can't sleep that night <laughs> uh, and then wake up the next day and watch it, you know, without any emotion attached to it, watch the film, get better um, and take that approach. And then the film will reveal a lot, especially when you're when you're not looking at it through a lens of um, the emotion that comes with the game. Um, if there's something that needs to be addressed specifically, I guess I'll make that judgment in, in real time. Um, but everybody wants to win. They all want to win. They all want to put up numbers. They all want to play well. They're, they're all individually hard on themselves. I think the players are their harshest critics. Us as coaches, we're our harshest critics, or at least should be. Um, and as long as everybody takes ownership of their individual role and figures how, how could I be better to help the group, um, I think that's when you start to see, you know, the winds piling up and you create a much, much more fruitful experience, I think, from that. It's, it's awesome to talk about. And it strikes me as that one of the challenges that we have as coaches is that too often we talk about the obvious and we don't need to talk about things that are obvious, which is, you know, something, for example, oh, we should play hard. Right. Or, you know, we won or lost the game. Those things are obvious. So what you're essentially saying is that you're diving deeper when you do finally get to the point of talking about the process of winning or losing and what goes into it more than the actual obvious outcome. Um, is, is that fair to say? Yeah, I guess the old adage of, you know, trust the process. Um, it, it is about a process, whether you're working on, you know, breaking down your shots specifically in your mechanics or you're talking about the process of preparing to win a game. Um, I think it's extremely important to focus on that. It's very easy to say, man, we didn't, we didn't play hard or we didn't do this or we didn't do that. I think you see guys playing harder when you create more clarity, I think, as a coach, as far as what guys are supposed to do individually in their roles and also how you're supposed to execute on both ends of the court. So once you see and feel that clarity and guys know what they're doing and there's a system in place that holds players accountable to their roles and what they're supposed to do on the court, um, I think you start to see teams play hard. But if there's a broken down pick and roll coverage, it might look like they drove down the middle of the paint. We weren't, quote unquote, playing hard. But maybe that was my fault for not clarifying what pick and roll coverage we were in. Um, or maybe it was one of the players who didn't communicate what we were in. That's why I like to watch a film after and not emotionally react to a lot of these things. Because what I'll see on film the next day might be, hey, guys, at the end of the game, I know we thought we messed this up. That was 100 percent on me. You know, I called the wrong coverage or I didn't make it clear in the huddle when we were going to play defense. I drew up an offensive play, whatever the case may be. Um, I think it's very important to, to kind of look at things through an emotionless lens, for lack of a better term, as much as possible and just kind of trust that process of, you know, preparing, trying to execute and then evaluating after and then just getting better from there. And it's just an endless cycle. Great stuff. And speaking of pick and roll coverage, uh, we're going to use your expertise having been exposed to NBA and international trends and concepts and talk about sure. some defensive best practices and maybe just off the top and it, regardless of whether you use them or not, are there any trends or anything that you saw internationally specifically that uh, kind of got you thinking and uh, stimulated you to kind of dive deeper into it after you saw it? Yeah, defensively. Um, and I know you've talked about it a lot. I know, uh, you know, Ryan, Ryan Pannone has gone over it a lot. We, I, I, I had the, uh, the pleasure of coaching against him, you know, a couple games. He's, he, he's a really, really smart coach. Um, teams execute really well. They call it that, that next pick and roll coverage um, with that, that heavy nail help um, and then scramming out of that, maxing out. I think that's a really interesting concept. I think we saw it in the NBA a little bit with the Utah Jazz. I haven't seen teams. Uh, I haven't watched, been watching a lot of G League this year. Not as much NBA, obviously, during the season. But I don't know if teams are still doing that. But I thought that was a really interesting concept. Um, uh, have you seen it in the G League? Because I haven't seen it that much in the NBA, truthfully, uh, yet. It's definitely it's more international in uh, Europe. Yeah, I, I have not seen it yet that we played against it. Um, 
Cameron Payne, who played for us a couple of years ago, um, was one of the smartest defenders I'd ever been around. He was, he was like nexting on his own. <laughs> it almost <laughs> looked like, you know, and it, it was actually helping us out. We looked at it and we were like, maybe this is something that we can, we can implement or, you know, we can game plan for, especially as, as the playoffs were approaching season got cut short, obviously. Uh, but I think that's a really interesting concept because at the end of the day, teams are trying to get to the middle teams are trying to get downhill and they're trying to get to the rim either for obviously layups or to draw the defense force rotation, long closeouts and kick out. That's, that's how teams are trying to play. Um, and so you, te- you see teams icing still, I think it's, it's about half and half. Um, now some teams icing, some are escorting it into the screen, whipping under at the last minute, whatever they're doing to keep the ball out of the middle of the floor and getting driven at the nail. So that's a concept I've always found really interesting. Um, I don't know enough about it personally to, to teach it and execute it yet. Um, but something that, that I think if, I think it's something at the very least that you can implement like out of timeouts, um, if, if, if you're getting hurt at the nail, but something that you should practice for sure. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see. I mean, I know the NBA spacing rules and obviously the quality of players on the floor make it harder probably to do it. Um, but uh, we'll see over time. And uh, talking about pick and roll defense and pick and roll coverage, uh, you know, we, we talk about uh, it's it, you, your who, their who where is it located and when is it happening in the game? What are some other things that come into decision-making for you as a coach to determine pick and roll coverage for your defense? Yeah, I think besides, besides your general philosophy and your system that you have and your base coverage of what you want to do, you know, we could, we call it our base. This is where in our base coverage, which is, you know, this is how we guard the side, no matter what, this is how we guard the middle. These players are that good at the G league level, especially at the NBA level where it, your coverages will change from game to game. Um, And it's not just the other team's personnel. When you've got some younger players that are still developing, quote unquote, um, they might not be ready for some of, you know, your schemes and pick and roll coverages that you've seen executed very well at the NBA level. Um, So you got to know your own personnel as well. As you work through that and try to develop these guys, um, you know, we, we weren't very good at icing the basketball a couple of years ago. And we had some young players. We had a young guy, Moses Brown, um, who, has developed tremendously over the last couple of years, but going back and forth between Portland, for example, and our team, um, it's not that they were running such different coverages, um, but it was, it was different to a degree based on who we were preparing for. So we realized was we wanted to just simplify it for Moses, for example. Um, So we, we didn't have him ice and we didn't have him, um, you know, in our normal pick and roll coverage that we were doing in the middle. So we just had him yelling left and right. That's all it was. The screen's coming from the left. The screen's coming from the right. Um, and then you just don't allow rejects. Guy gets in the ball, forces it over the screen. We just tried to simplify it as best we possibly can. So it's it's not just their personnel you're preparing for. I think a lot of times you got to see your own personnel as well, just as importantly. In that example, don't uh, allow rejects. Can you talk about that a little bit deeper? What is the emphasis then in terms of the technique to not allow the reject? Yeah, number one is early talk from the big. Uh, we, we call it ELC, early, loud, and continuous. Um, so we want to yell. We're not, we're not a talking team. We're a yelling team. We want to yell the pick and roll coverage or the direction the screen is coming, whatever the case may be, wherever the ball is on the floor, you know, three times at the top of your lungs as loudly as possible. And thankfully, in the G League, a lot of times there's not a lot of fans at the game, so you're able to hear everybody talking, which is good. Um, that activates the guard on the ball getting into the basketball and and we define that by getting to his hip and forcing him into the screen. Now, whether you go over or under the screen, if they're going to set it depends on the personnel, obviously, but you always want to get into the ball. So that's the second level of it. And then they got to get back in front. Great stuff. And uh, such an important thing, because obviously if an offensive player rejects, they beat two and forces you into scramble situations right away. So you talked about top and wing and, and without necessarily giving away your base, do you traditionally have two different base defenses based on the, on the location of the ball screen? Yeah. Yeah. So we've, we've got our side pick and roll coverages and then we've got, you know, our middle pick and roll coverages. And sometimes it can get a little bit murky, right? Like how do you define the side, right? Is it, is it, the baseline hash marks extended? Is it the lane lines? Whatever the case may be, every team's a little bit different. Um, at the at the very least, even if you quote unquote you know, don't know what you should be calling technically, based on breaking down the film and actually you know circling, hey, this is where it is on the floor. That early loud talk can solve a lot. Um, and you always we tell our guards you got to honor what the big says. So we'll see guards sometimes 
get into an ice position and he didn't hear ice. Whether that's the big fault or not, or he should have done it, you can't get into a coverage if it wasn't communicated to you by the big. Um, so it always, it always starts with that early loud talk, no matter what. First person that talks is right. And then from there, it's all about solutions, right? Like even if someone does something wrong, somebody can solve it if they recognize. So is that something that you actually can teach or that you can intuitively get them to that point? Get them to the point of being able to cover for mistakes. Yeah. Cover. I mean, at the end of the day, you got five guys, you know what I mean? Kind of sometimes we call it like in transition, like you're, you know, you don't, you don't match up to your man. It's a man. I've, I've heard it called a bar fight before. You know what I mean? You just gotta, you just gotta heard that. find somebody. Yeah. It's interesting. Uh, that comes, I think from the uh, director of sports psychology with the Mavs, Don Collison, he said, you know, transition defense is a bar fight. Now when teams get you, you know, into what a lot of teams call the blender, right. A scramble on offense. Um, it's a little bit of a bar fight. You just got to keep bodies on bodies. You would like to keep it one-on-one, the pick and roll. You'd like to keep two on two ideally. Um, but in the case that that happens, you need people in their proper positioning, a pr- proper position, shrinking the floor so that next man over understands what his responsibility is. You know, so those are the three levels. Obviously, you got the ball, you've got one help, uh, one pass away help, and then you've got, you know, low help as well. So th- those things can be hashed out by being in position first, by sprinting in your shrink positions based on where the ball is. And then you can kind of hash it out from there. And then from there, uh, identifying whether it's an open side pick and roll, a single side or a double side in terms of where your tag and where your coverages are. And those are three complex things, aren't they? So do you have any uh, ideas for us to be able to understand better how to uh, determine our defensive coverages based on the location of the other offensive players? Yeah, so single side tags, there, there are some teams that will, um, that will offer the tag from the single side man. Um, and and it could be a high tag, it might be a lower tag, and they're willing to give up that, you know, that pitch back pass, you know, to the wing, not to allow the three, but they're definitely trying to take that tag away. We've seen teams do it where um, they're not tagging with that single side guy, they're tagging from the strong side low man, and then Xing out on the weak side, there's a couple different ways that you can do it. Um, But it's, it's something that you need to talk about, and that you need to clarify defense is not just playing hard. Um, it's, it's not, it's, it's creating clarity in what you need to be doing based on the action and the spacing that you're being presented with. And the game offensively is, it's played so much faster with so much more pace and in so much more space than it ever has been. Um, so you need to talk about these things. You need to talk about what you're going to do against, you know, peels and ghost screens, you know, whatever everybody calls them. You need to talk about what you do if you set it, um, if you want to keep a matchup, hedging the screen, whatever the case may be. Um, there's there's a lot. There's a lot of layers to defense. It's not just playing hard. you got to really create that clarity. And there's so many different actions um, you got to go through. The, the, the good thing, I think, the beneficial thing about coaching the G League is a lot of G League teams, as well as NBA teams, obviously, are, are running a lot of the same actions. So if you're running, you know, pistol action, for example, as a team, you're going to face that a lot as well. So you're kind of killing two birds with one stone when you're running a lot of your offensive sets, five out, you know, double staggers away, you know, high single wide pins, uh, whatever the case may be. There's a lot of teams running the same things. Um, so you, you really get that practice every single day, both offensively and defensively. Are there good defensive possessions in your world where you still get scored on? And if so, is that something that you highlight for players to get them to understand that they did things right? But sometimes when you do things right, according to philosophy, you can still get scored on. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think you, what you want to define besides coverages, you want to define what shots you want to take away and you want to define what shots you're trying to force the other team into, whatever the case may be, right? Long contested twos is, is the big thing that, uh, everybody's been talking about over the last you know five to ten years. Those are the low value shots that you want to force other teams into. Sometimes players, and that's sometimes a lot of the times, players are just really good offensive players, and you could play damn near perfect defense, and the ball could be just out of reach on the shot, and the guy's hitting the shot. That's where the next play mentality comes in, um, understanding whether or not you guys did what you were supposed to do defensively, and we did what we were supposed to do. And if you did, don't be discouraged by it. You know, we, we truly believe and our players believe, too, that if we stick to our defensive principles and we stick to our coverages and we stick to what we know and what we do well, um, that over time, 
you know, these possessions will compound into a good defensive game. Sometimes you can play perfect defense. There's just really good players out there. So the key is not being discouraged by it, being able to really evaluate and understand, did we do the right thing and not be so influenced by the results necessarily? Well, I imagine you, like all coaches, have spent thousands of hours thinking about how to defend Spain pick and rolls, for example. And yet I still see Spain pick and rolls working. So <laughs> it's a great example. But maybe give us your best thoughts on defending Spain pick and roll. Oh, yeah, there's a couple of different ways. I think if you have the right personnel, you know, triple switching is something that um, is, is, is tough to go against. Um, you know, you can drop the big if they know that the stack pick and roll is coming. You can drop the big below the second screen and just switch the guards. I've seen teams stay with their own because offensively you're anticipating the switch. Um, so sometimes if as long as you drop the big underneath and you stay with your own, a lot of teams are maybe surprised by that. Uh, so it just depends. And it comes with scouting. you got to be able to see how teams are guarding it. you got to see as the defensive team, um, you know, how, how they're running it offensively. You've got to do your homework. you got to watch it. you got to prepare. Um, but triple switching, especially with teams disguising how they're going to get into the Spain pick and roll, is it prob probably the best way, just like the Warriors have shown over the years, that if you have the right personnel, switching everything is the toughest defense to go against as well. One of the other switching situations that we're seeing more of is switching the guard onto the, the Ram screen situation where mm -hmm. say a guard might screen a big to the ball screen and now the guard switches onto the big. So it becomes that triple switch at the point of the ball screen. So right. seeing that a lot more and more, are you seeing anything else in terms of some trends like that in terms of Ram screens or other types of uh, pick and roll defense? Yeah, no, I, 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 I've seen a couple things. I think I saw on, on Twitter the other day, somebody posted, you know, about the warriors doing those, those Ram screens. I, it's, it's a really interesting look when you triple switch it um, to, to switch almost into a top lock and just be physical, very physical with the guy coming up to screen so that, you know, they can't peel out or set that ghost screen. And, you know, you are forcing a switch based on your physicality and at least impeding his route and you're steering him into the direction. And then if they want to, you know, roll your guard out underneath, you can get to your scram principles. Um, as well. So um, yeah, you know, if you could switch those screens, but a lot of teams talk about switching and switching is not, switching should not be lazy. Mm -hmm. You know, you shouldn't be out there, they're point switching because that's what we love as offensive coaches is a point switching team. Um, what you want to do is you, you want to switch physically so that you can take teams out of their actions and keep yourself out of rotation. So it actually should be an aggressive physical mindset more than just, hey, we're, we're playing a zone and we're just point switching all over the place. Well, I love that example of aggressive mindset, that uh, top blocking action. And, and maybe to speak to that, because internationally, I know you've seen this more, is there's more situational denial. And I think I'm seeing that a little bit more at both the NCAA and the NBA level as well, where there's situations where players will get top blocked just to disrupt. We know we can't take the ball out of a great scorer's hand necessarily, but we can disrupt where they catch it. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, I think, you know, first and foremost, I think defenses um, in general starts with an attitude and a mindset, but that sort of physicality, denying elbow catches or pushing them out above the three-point line, um, side out of bounds, underneath, if you know the play is coming, you know it's a zipper screen, really aggressively and physically trying to deny those catches, um, first and foremost is, is a mindset and a mentality, and then you can get into proper technique and whatnot, but I think not only the game, but I think the refs honor physical teams, you know, that, that aren't necessarily using their hands, but they're just being physical. Um, you know, I've seen, we played against teams that are, it seems like they're literally pushing us around on the offensive end, the way that they're switching. And, you know, we don't get any calls. So the game and the refs, have, I think, honor, um, you know, the, the more aggressive team um, when it comes to, to switching and playing defense like that. So we, well, we the, the, is it true that the more you foul, the more you get away with, right? Yeah, I think at the end of the day, refs don't want to see you being handsy. That, that's the big thing. I mean, I, they're, the freedom of movement calls, for example, you know, if a guard gets over a screen, if they see it all, you wrapping your hand around the big, it doesn't even need to be impeding his progress. The moment they see that, they're immediately calling a foul. There's obviously a lot more physical things that happen throughout the game that are not called, but guys are showing their hands and they're playing with their chest more than anything. Um, I think that's the big thing, especially if you can 
if you can get in front of the ball, like on a closeout, for example, you can get in front of the ball and show your hands and chest him. You could you could throw your chest at him um, as long as he doesn't flop. It's probably not a foul. Um, so I think that's the big thing in teaching your defense is not to just be too careless with how handsy and grabby you are, for lack of a better term, showing your hands and being physical more with your body and your chest than anything. Speaking of that, covering a cutter off the ball, uh, you know, traditionally we used to teach get on the outside hip, chase so you don't get screened, you don't run into the screen, obviously. Is mm -hmm. that still something that's taught? And then if so, what is the path of recovery if you are chasing a great shooter, say, off of a screen? Yeah, so that that's that's a two man coverage, just like pick and roll, you know, so if you see, you know, if you're if you get to the body, like we call it, you know, you want to get to the body you want to force him into the screen, you want to chase his numbers, you know, if you do get hit, because you're chasing at the very least, you're going to be able to to rear view contest and hopefully run him off the line, you know, if they decide to curl it straight to the basket. Um, then that might turn into an emergency switch situation based on where the big is. But just like pick and roll coverage when you're guarding shooters like that, you know, the, the emergency switch is always in play as well, whether he's getting to the three point line or he's curling all the way to the basket off of that shot. Um, so, again, you know, it's like switching rules all, you know, even if you're not in a switching defense, that emergency switch and that communication um, is always in play. Does, is the emergency switch and switching in general now because it's such a part of the game? Does that become the default? generally that uh okay if we're in trouble we can always switch and figure it out from there like you said this bar fight mentality yeah absolutely i think at the end of the day the term i that i i use the most with our coaching staff and, and i've heard and i really like it is you want to ultimately defensively you want to keep bodies on bodies you you, you want to make sure no matter what whatever defense you're in that that offensive player that has the ball always sees a body in front of them. That's the goal. So if you get a shooter or even a driver, whatever it is that gets chased off a screen, he curls right to the basket. If that man can't recover, it might have to just be an emergency switch, but he cannot just go, you know, right down the runway to an open layup. Um, he's he's got to see a body in front of him. And, you know, the really good scrambling defensive teams, the first team I think of is Toronto when they won the championship, those guys would fly around and it wasn't necessarily scripted. A lot of the time, once they got into a scramble, they were just so good at always having a body in front of the ball. So whether it's pin downs, pick and roll, uh, scrambling defense off of closeouts, you know, and redriving the driving kick, always having a body there, that next man mentality, um, I think is extremely important to building a great defense. Absolutely. And uh, you, you said handsy, and we can talk a little bit more about that, but specifically, specifically in reference to at the basket now, because this is where I'm thinking, that I've seen great development from basketball and coaching in general is this wall up concept at the rim and the rule of verticality, which I think is being honored more by officials as well. And maybe that's just my opinion, but uh, can you talk about the technique of contesting at the rim without fouling in this wall up type of situation? Yeah. Again, as, as long as you show hands, you're inside the restricted area and you jump straight up in the air and absorb that contact, it, it will never be a foul. And I don't know what the percentages are exactly. I probably should off the top of my head of contested shots at the rim. It's, it's not that high. They're as high as you would think, right? It's the open layups and the open dunks um, that are obviously higher value shots. But as long as you have a big or anybody underneath that jump with great verticality, first team that comes to mind is the Lakers when they won the championship. They were a great verticality team, every single one of them to a man. Um, it's something that you need to practice. It needs to become of become a part of your defensive culture and you need to teach it. You know, there's a lot of guys that just don't want to embrace that contact at the rim. So you'll see them at the rim, but they'll jump out of the way and just try to take a swipe at it. Some guys with their length are able to get away with that and still block the shot. I think most guys, um, you, you need to teach them specifically the technique of jumping straight up in the air with their hands and, and absorbing it in the chest. And I think once you get guys to do that, they'll realize like, it, it doesn't hurt that much. <laughs> I know it's a physical game, but we got a guy in our G League team, uh, Loudon Love, who, who's great at it. He played at Wright State, a little undersized, um, you know, for the center position. He's about 6'7", six, 6'8", six, but physical. He was a football player in high school, and, and he embraces that. He's great at it. Every single time he's at the rim, he's jumping straight up at the air, not fouling, and just taking it right in the chest. And more often than not, they're missing at the rim when he's in position there. So the key is getting, getting guards to buy into that. You know, Alex Caruso, he's he's great at verticality. He embraces, uh, you know, the physicality of jumping up and absorbing it in your chest. So as long as you show hands, you embrace it in the chest um, and you do it enough where you realize, all right, I'm, I'm not going to get hurt from this. And it also works.
Um, I think that's when you create buy-in. And not just that, but also the fact that it's not going to get called a foul. Because I think that's a barrier for people to overcome. Because, again, a lot of players come in probably to your place, but also to college. And traditionally, they're used to jumping the block shots. But we're really not talking about blocking a shot here. We're just talking about staying between ball and basket on the shot. And what we call don't give the offensive player an open window to shoot. Yes. Yeah. No, I think at the end of the day, you what's the desired result? Right. The, de the desired result, you know, for some guys might be a block, but at the end of the day, you, you want to create misses at the rim and you want to create tough shots. So what do you need to do to get to that desired result at the rim? And the key is if you're in place, if you're not going to take the charge outside the circle, you got to be inside the restricted area and embrace the physicality, go straight up vertical. And it, and it won't be a foul. I mean, really these refs are just looking for, grabbing, touching, all, all of that with their hands. As long as you show your hands, um, specifically with verticality, but even guarding the basketball, if, if you're closing out to a driver, you just need to show your hands. Um, show your hands, but elbows, traditionally we try and keep elbows behind ears, which I know is not necessarily physically possible for some people, but is that generally the reference too, to keep the elbow back or shoulders I heard, back? I haven't heard that before, okay. but just when curious. I- when I, yeah, when I actually when I actually do it, I I think I naturally do put my elbows you behind my ears. Do it, yeah. Yeah, uh, but that's that's a good teaching point for sure. People can't see us, but we're imitating it right now. So if you yeah, watch exactly. on YouTube, you'll see it. I've, I've used my hands a lot here, but uh, yeah, no, exactly. Awesome. Yeah, behind here is I, I like that technique. I love this depth of conversation. And then again, so uh, I just visited UC, UC Irvine, uh, Russ, uh, Russ Turner. They do a great job there in their program with this. And I saw multiple drills that they ran to work on this concept. And I want coaches to understand, I'm so glad you're talking about it because this is something that's very teachable and it's really teaching it from different angles, isn't it? And different paths of helping rather than this traditional, we always want to get help outside the lane, but that's not always possible, especially at the NBA level with all the spacing. So what are some different ways that maybe you work on this concept? Yeah, so first and foremost, you, you want to be in position based on where the ball is, right? So if, if you are the guy that's supposed to be, you know, the, the low man help, low hole, home, you know, whatever they call it, the way you get yourself into position is first and foremost by sprinting to your shrink, sprinting into position so that you are there on the catch wherever the ball is. And then you're able to build your defense from there. In the G League, it can be a little bit different too. If the ball stalls, the defensive three seconds comes into play. So, you know, then your principles are in play as well. Do you reset to the weak side? Do you reset to the strong side? And when you do that, or if you're not in position, um, you need to make sure that you at least meet the ball at the rim. So I think in order to, to solve those problems head on, first and foremost, we stress a lot, even in our shell defensive drills, every single day, sprinting to shrink, sprinting to shrink and moving with the ball and being on a, being on a string. You know, you've heard the term like, jump to the pass. We don't want guys to jump. We want guys to, to sprint. We want them to pivot and run and sprint to shrink. Um, and we, you know, I'm, I'm kind of annoying to our players when it comes to it, but if, if we don't do that, the whistle blows, you got to do it again, do it again, do it again. And we're not perfect at it. I think, um, you know, it's just something that you got to hold guys accountable to. They got to hold each other accountable to it. And once they see it work, once they see that the ball stalls because, that offensive player sees help behind and he sees that next man. I mean, that's when, that's when you got a high level defense is when he's seeing bodies, um, you know, from the catch. I love that sprint to shrink and uh, uh, coming back to ball screens a little bit. One other ball screen I wanted to get your opinion on is double ball screens and kind of how you would approach covering it. Is the first ball screen the one that has the coverage or are you covering with the second one? And then that leads us to this offensive counter, which is we're seeing a lot more people ghost that second screen to take away that because traditionally the second player would be the one in coverage. Yeah, so usually offensively, you're going to see the screen set by the four, because if it's set, if the second screen is set by the four, then that would probably just end up being a switch for most teams. So if they're going to switch that first screen, you at least got your five. If you are in coverage with the five and you're not just switching that triple switching, obviously always, always helps, right? It solves uh, everything, doesn't it? <laughs> a lot of times it does. And you just got to have the right personnel to do it for sure. Um, but yeah, I think, I think it, it will usually be coverage with the five, which is the second screener. 
Um, I've seen teams before, if they're in coverage with their four, you know, that, that might be an ice and you keep it in the sideline and not even let it get to the double drag. I've seen teams just say, Hey, get through both of them guards. You just got to, you got to haul ass and you got to fight through both screens. And then that's how we're going to beat it. Um, so there's a couple different ways to do it, but it's based on the offense. The offense is usually going to set it with the four first. Most teams are switching one through four. Um, so you can stay with your own or you can switch that one through four screen. But then that that second one is the one where you just you want to stay in coverage. Does it traditionally like a double ball screen say let's coming to the, the wing, let's say? Uh, mm -hmm. Is that first screen traditionally your base coverage? And then the second screen, if it happens, because we don't know officially if it's there or not, that becomes a certain different coverage or do they both become base coverages for you? Yeah, I think they, they both become base coverages and base okay. might be switching to one of the four. Uh, sure. Base might be the five is in a drop or whatever it is, they're at the level, or whatever your um, specific defensive principles are. Um, but the, the one thing you need to do is you need to communicate that there is there are two picks coming, two screens, double drag, however you communicate it as a coach. Um, you, you do need to communicate that as a team that the two, two picks and the two screens and the double drag is, is approaching um, so that you know exactly you know, where you're supposed to be. There might be a team that's so good at it that is ghosting those screens that you say, hey, every, we got two picks coming. They go screen this. They peel out of it with the second guy as well. We're just going to stay square and stay with our guys. You know, that's how we're going to approach. And if they do set it, then we're switching or we're in coverage, whatever the case may be. Um, it, it really depends on, it can depend on personnel as well. A lot of conversations with coaches at a lot of levels this year. Um, what's become obvious is coaches are starting to coach much more to their player's solution than their solution. And this example in ball screen, I want to get your thoughts on is particularly this. I know you have your base coverage as your team philosophy, but then certain players do different coverages better than another coverage, right? So mm -hmm. you sometimes have to adapt and coach to their solution instead of yours. Can you talk about that? Because I know that's such an important part of what you do. Yeah, so it's kind of goes back to the Moses Brown example. You know, like you have your own philosophy in how you think a certain player should be guarded, right? In a perfect world, if you have the perfect players who perfectly execute every coverage that you want, whenever you want, um, it becomes a little bit easier. Hey, this guy is a score. We're going to have to be at the level. We're going to have to hedge this ball screen or, you know, we're switching physically, whatever the case may be. There are some players that just aren't as good at that coverage that you ideally would want against that player. And in the G League, you got to, you still have to play those guys, right? Moses was an assignment player from the Trailblazers. So we couldn't just not play in that game if we were playing against a smaller team or we wanted to execute a specific coverage. So it was more important for that specific example that we give Moses the best solution for himself. You know, how do we get the best version of Moses in that pick and roll coverage? You know, Moses was really young. He was internalizing a lot of different things, playing for two different, completely different organizations. So it was really, how do we simplify it for him considering he just got here today and he's going to play a game with us and wasn't here with us for practice. Um, so that's how we saw it from a, a G League standpoint. But again, it goes back to the idea that your personnel is just, an important, just as important as the other personnel. Um, so I, I agree with that point specifically as well. Yeah, it's fascinating. And uh, I, it's such a such a great improvement in coaching, I think, overall, uh, understanding your personnel and uh, adapting to what they do best. Uh, anything different on dribble handoffs in terms of uh, your philosophy, in terms of covering them? I know that's something that the game uh, definitely there's way more dribble handoffs than there used to be, say, 20 years ago. Yeah, I think you got to again, it starts with personnel. So, you know, if a guy's a shooter. You can you can switch those. You have the option of switching it, obviously. Um, and if you want to maintain matchups, then you got to stay with your own. If you're staying with your own, then it becomes personnel based. You know, if he's a driver that characteristically is trying to get downhill, especially up, you know those those uphill DHOs coming out of the corner um, where they're trying to get actually downhill once they catch it. You know, you might be able to get to the body and then whip under, you know, really quickly and make sure you you negate him trying to get downhill. Um, if it's a shooter and you know that he's coming off the dribble handoff trying to just rise up and shoot, then you got to stay with him, chase his numbers. If he decides, you know, to crawl all the way to the basket, and you get hit. That's when your emergency red comes into play as well. So it really depends on your overall philosophy of whether you want to stay with your own or you just want to switch those. Um, but a lot of times if, if you're switching and you're not switching physically, 
that's when like those little keeper plays to the basket can come into play and, and teams can just get kind of lazy, you know, with their switching. So again, it, the way you negate a lot of that offensive action is, is by doing it physically and escorting guys into screens and making sure that you're, you're closing that scene, you're closing the gap um, where they could either, you know, drive the ball back against the grain or keep it, whatever the case may be. Well, and one of the hardest decisions on handoffs is whether to pressure the dribbler or to drop off the dribbler in, in, in that. And again, is that personnel driven or is that somewhat philosophical for you? I think it's personnel driven, uh, but you, you got to make sure that, that they're not rejecting it as well. You know, they're not going into the DHO and then rejecting it. And they're going, they're going the opposite way, which I haven't seen, you know, a ton necessarily if they're getting the dribble handoff, if they're, they're not going to do the dribble handoff, it's probably going to be a keeper play. Um, but yeah, it's, it, it's personnel and, and teams run their dribble handoffs differently. You know, sometimes it's a dribble handoff, but sometimes it's a dribble pitch into like a, into a peel. There's a lot of different ways and sophisticated ways that these teams are, are trying to exploit defenses um, offensively. Um, so I think it's, yeah, it's personnel. Um, but, you know, you have your principles as well. You just, you got to pivot every single game. And then, of course, stagger handoffs, which we're seeing almost <laughs> almost more st stagger handoffs than anything nowadays. And uh, first player goes and screens the cutter. Second player runs the handoff, that type of mentality. So uh, is that generally a chase? And then uh, at the point of the handoff, that's based on your base philosophy or are we doing something different on stagger handoffs? Yeah, you're, you're getting to the body. I think you're getting to the body. You're making sure that he's using that screen. Again, some teams, I, I know I'm it might seem like I'm giving non-answers. I'm kind of pivoting back and forth, but it, it depends on your overall philosophy. If, if you're a top blocking team, you don't want the shooter to even get to it. You know, that that's one thing that you're going to do. It's not even going to get to the handoff, right? And then it's going to get to the second guy that's probably screening. Um, if, if you're a team that wants to escort him into the screen and stay with your matchup, then you're for sure getting to the body. I'll be getting over that first one. And then if you need to whip under at the last second, you know, if he's a driver, um, even if he's a shooter, then if you're going to go under, you're going to go under at the last second on that second screen. But the way that that makes that easier to get underneath and take away the shot as well, as well as the drive is, is by staying attached and staying close to the body. Same thing with pick and roll coverage. You know, if teams that go under because a guy is not as good of a shooter off the dribble, they get into a bad habit sometimes of not getting into the ball. You still want to get into the ball on an under to bring that screener up as high as possible to the point of contact. So then you can whip underneath then it's not, it's not daring guys to shoot and just backing off unless that's a special <laughs> coverage that if somebody wants to dare somebody to shoot, but you're, you're always getting into the ball. You're always getting into the body. Um, and then you're sussing it out from there. Coach. I mean, all you've done in a really short time in coaching, being a young coach, really inspiring. I think there's a great message for all the young coaches out there, but all coaches in general, just about the path that you've taken uh, from, you know, Indiana to spending time with Tim Grover at Attack Athletics to the Bakersfield Jam and now on to Dallas and Uganda and different things that you've had. Can you talk just briefly about your experience and then uh, some of the things that led to your success? Yeah, well, one thing that I'm that I'm very grateful for, and I, I didn't realize it at the time, was I discovered my passion to coach at a relatively young age. Um, I wasn't that great of a player when I was in high school, but I loved the game and I still played a lot. I started coaching younger kids when I was about 17 years old, fifth and sixth graders. I saw guys like Lawrence Frank, Caleb Canales, Frank Vogel, all these guys as I grew up coaching in the NBA, doing research on their path and realizing that it was a possibility. Um, and there, there are different couple different ways I could do it. You could be a manager, you could be an intern. And it was guys like that that paved the way for someone like me and other coaches today um, to be able to believe that it's, it's possible. And again, I'm grateful for the fact that I figured out what I wanted to do early. And a, a big part of why I'm still doing this today and did it from the time I was 17 was when I, I told my parents that I wanted to be an NBA basketball coach um, when we were talking about what major I, I wanted to choose to go to Indiana. It's the first time I told them I wanted to coach as a career in the NBA. They didn't tell me I was crazy. Um, they, they didn't try to get me to do something else. Um, they were in full support. And I think they felt and saw the passion that I had for coaching and teaching and that I really wanted to do it. And I, I think it's important to not only have those people around you that, that support your dreams, you know, as long as you, you have the work ethic and, and you have the right vision and, it, and it's a sensical approach to what you want to do, um, it's important you have the, the self-belief. Um, when I was 25 years old, Bakersfield was bought by the Phoenix Suns. I was out of a job for about 
10 months before I went to New Zealand just to kind of keep my career going. And again, that was a defining point of my career specifically was, do I give it up? Do I do something else? You know, I was pretty heartbroken about not having an opportunity. Um, and it was, it was my mom and my dad, again, that said, you're not giving up. This is just a bump in the road. We're here every step of the way. And to have that support, um, I think was, was integral to the fact that I'm still here um, and, and able to share, share my story. And I'm, I'm, I'm inspired by so many other people. And I'm just very grateful that, that I have the opportunity to potentially inspire young coaches as well. And my best advice to them is to find what you're passionate about, to pursue it relentlessly every single day with humility and embrace the experiences. And, and that's really it. I know it sounds pretty, pretty hokey in general. Um, it's easier said than done, but to have the opportunity to go to Africa and see a whole different part of the world um, and be able to broaden my perspective on different cultures and people, and then see the impact that it has on me to be able to help others here in the G League or wherever, the, wherever it takes you. Um, I think it's important. I think it's important to embrace your experiences, to enjoy it, not be so focused on where you're going next. I would say the guys that I've seen get called up are the ones that enjoy the experience and don't worry about the call up. Um, you know, everybody's got a different career trajectory, whether they're coaches or players and just enjoy it. Like we said, the last 18 months has uh, taught us that it can all be taken away from you in a heartbeat. Um, so it's important to enjoy it. Go to the gym every day with enthusiasm and an appreciation for where you're at um, and be adaptable and, and enjoy the experience as much as possible. Can I add two more things to that? One is you are very likable <laughs> and, and that's intentional, it. right? Like your personality for, and, and in preparing for this, the, I've just so many people had great things to say about you as a person. And, and that's got to be intentional because that obviously makes people want to work with you. So I think that's a part that I think coaches don't understand is being likable and, uh, you know, being intentional in your efforts to get along with people. All those things are a part of it. And then the second thing is live near the gym. And I love that part of it. Uh, and I want you to talk about that because I think people don't get that part. If you're a young coach, especially live as close as you can, as cheap as you can, so that you, <laughs> you can function in the way that would, again, draw attention to what you're doing. And both those things worked for you, didn't they? Yeah, it did. I, at the end of the day, um, you know, living close to the gym um, is about availability. You know, at the, at the end of the day, I, I moved out to Bakersfield and I, I was single, just pursuing a dream. And I just wanted to make myself available. The guy called me at 10 o'clock. You know, I answered the phone if he needed to be taken to the grocery store because, you know, there wasn't Uber back then and stuff like that. You know, I, I, I did that. I, I just I just tried to help is really what I did. And I think you can have your own personal goals deep down um, that, that you pursue. I don't think that's selfish and it's, it's, it's OK. Um, but I think the day to day approach, you know, as a coach and as a person in general, I talk to our players about this all the time, just do your best, do your best to help. And I, I think when people asked me about, you know, how, how do you create the respect between you and a player, not being a former player and this and that, you have to show them how much you know and this. All I did was I, I rebounded extremely hard for them. I threw them really good passes. I answered the phone when they called. Um, and then organically, the relationship developed from there. Then you can share knowledge, you can share experiences and, and watch it blossom from there. But, you know, that, that's my advice to young coaches is, is go into a job with no agenda other than you're just trying to help guys get better and you're trying to help yourself get better every day so that you can better help others. I think if that's at the core of your profession and your teaching and your approach, everything will just work out and there will be bumps in the road, but as long as you stick with your core values and that approach of just kind of helping others get better and you can still help yourself be better. Um, I think if you can kind of approach it through that, you know, looking at it through that lens, I think it just kind of works out in the end. Um, easy for me to say, I guess, but that's just kind of, that's been my experience and continue to surround yourself with good people, uh, young coaches, you know, find mentors. Uh, I was, I, I was not as likable when I was 22. I was pretty arrogant coming out of college and I needed a couple mentors to be brutally honest with me about what it meant to be a professional. Uh, they, they opened my eyes to a couple of my blind spots that I had and I needed to be open to that. 
And I think a lot of coaches that are up and coming to need to be, they need to seek out mentors that are going to give them the truth, not just tell them that they love them like their parents might. Um, they need honest feedback about what it means to be a professional in this field and to be their best self. And it's important to internalize those things, listen, and then, then apply it um, and, and self-reflect as much as possible. We saved the best for last. Thanks, coach. I mean, that's just tremendous advice and practical advice as well. And uh, can't thank you enough. I know a lot of coaches that maybe haven't heard of you yet will be following you even closer now. And uh, I can't thank you enough for sharing the game with us. No, thank you. And, and I know we said at the beginning, but thank you so much for, for everything that you do. Uh, like I said, I, I poach a lot more than I share. So hopefully, uh, you know, uh, I'll be doing it a lot more and sharing experiences and whatnot. But um, can't thank you enough for all that you do for the basketball world. Good. Well, coaches, now, if you poach something from George, make sure you reach out on Twitter and give him a heads up and uh, give him a shout out. So that's awesome. So now you can feel it full circle, coach. Awesome. Yeah, I really appreciate that. Thanks so much, Chris.